right. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Man, okay, we're, we're awake. I love it every time. Well, welcome, uh, as, as Jamie already said, and Kristen. Uh, if we have not met, my name is CJ White, and I'm the director of groups and classes here at Fellowship Bible Church, uh, and I am excited to be here with you all this morning. Uh, as always, as it's a blessing that we get to come together and worship our risen, risen Savior together. Amen? Amen. All right. And listen, I'm going to give a little caveat on the get-go. you got going to have to bear with me this morning. This is going to be the first time I'm going to have to wear my glasses to read my Bible. Okay? So uh, just bear with me. Uh, listen, the, the sermon's already printed 14 point, so you didn't know that. Um, well, listen, again, good morning. Today we are in our second week of a series that we're walking through called Our House. Okay? And last week Alex showed us in several places in Scripture that the church is described as the house of God, right? That as we come together, we are known as the house of God. And we need to know something, and I want to say this to us at every point I get, is we have to remind ourselves that the church is not a what? The church is not a building. It's not an event we come to. The church is a who? The church is a group of people that have trusted and come to faith through the gospel of Christ, and now we're partnered together, and we are the house of God. Amen? So that is what we are going through and understanding. This is our house. We are gathered and scattered to worship the one true living God. So over the next several weeks, we're going to set aside time specifically to look at God's word and see what our house should be about as we follow Jesus. And again, last week, Alex was able to show us first off that in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that our house is a house of transformation. That as we come to know Jesus, we have moved from darkness to light, Right? We, we are now being transformed from one degree of glory at a time as we're beholding Jesus. He's transforming us, renewing our mind. This is a continual process until Jesus calls us home. And that brings us to today, and we're going to see that our house is to be a house of discipleship. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 through 10. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, for those of you that know me, know a little bit about my story, it's probably no surprise to you or you know that before I entered into ministry, I was a professional photographer, okay? So for about the first 10 years of Kelly Mine's marriage, um, by the way, we're coming up on 20 in two weeks, and so, yeah, unreal, praise God, uh, that I was a photographer. Now, I worked in a couple different studios, and I, then I had my own business and was predominantly an architecture photographer. But what you don't know is, how did that get started? Well, when I was 15 years old, uh, I remember coming home one night uh, from being out with some friends, and I unfortunately heard the devastating news that, that my grandfather had just passed away of a heart attack. And for me, that was the first time that someone close to me had, had passed away. And so I had to wrestle with that and, and, and was grieving. And then a couple weeks went by, and, and I was close with my, with my grandpa, Grandpa Charles. And uh, after some time, his belongings started to be handed out among family members, okay? And one of the things that was given to me was his Nikon F2 film camera. So anybody under the age of 23, yes, film, not digital. Like, this was a film camera, and he treasured that thing. He took it to the Grand Canyon. They spent six months of the year in retirement in Cabo San Lucas. Beautiful. Uh, but he was always taking pictures, and I got his camera, all the different lenses, all of these things, and I treasured that thing. So much so that I immediately enrolled in the next photography class at school. Uh, then I immediately wound up going to Santa Barbara, California, and getting my bachelor's degree in commercial advertising in photography. It sent me on this trajectory, a treasure I was given from my grandfather. But now, and I thought about this this week, I'm sitting there and I'm going, man, I treasured that camera so much. And now... It's sitting in my office closet, just collecting dust. And my kids are probably never going to know it, and it's not going to move along to them. And unfortunately for you and I, that can be a danger for us when we're following Jesus. When we come to trust in him, and we've been given this gift, we've been given this treasure of him forever, so often after time, the shine can wear off. All of a sudden, we're not so thrilled with it as before. And then the treasure just ends with us. We don't pass it along. We don't take joy in it. And that is never what the good Lord intended for us when we come to the treasure of the gospel. The gospel should not just sit on a shelf, 
collecting dust, just waiting and withering away. And today we're going to see that as Christians, since we've been entrusted with the gospel, we must pursue gospel-centered discipleship. So let me say that again. So since as Christians we've been entrusted with the gospel, therefore we must pursue gospel-centered discipleship. So now we'll read in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 10. Get your glasses. All right, here we go. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Now, in 2 Timothy, uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul. Okay, and this was the Apostle Paul writing letter to Timothy, second time he wrote to him, uh, and now he was in prison in Rome. This was his second imprisonment. He was at the end of his life. Uh, And Paul was communicating a personal farewell message to encourage young Timothy. This was very personal, intimate communication. And he wanted to tell Timothy all the aspects of following Jesus and in ways that he had heard from Paul. You see, Timothy was a disciple of Christ, but also Paul. He followed Paul to learn the ways of Jesus and the ins and outs of the, of the gospel. Timothy was in a discipleship relationship with Paul. And as we're discussing discipleship today, I'll say before we dig into the passage, it's important to define a couple of things. First is, well, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? Well, we can define a disciple of Christ as someone who is learning to apply the truths of the gospel to every aspect of everyday life. That is a disciple of Jesus. How do we apply the truths of the gospel in every aspect of my life? And Paul had told Timothy in the whole first chapter of 2 Timothy the truths of the gospel. Over and over, in in 1 Timothy 1.10, he says this. He says, through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is our hope. This is what we come to repent and trust in is Jesus coming, stepping off his throne, living a human life, wrapping on human flesh and living a perfect life for you and me so that through his death and resurrection, we now have salvation. The death that we face due to our sins is now done. It's abolished through Christ. That's the all-encompassing life of a disciple of Jesus. And this is the process of discipleship. We are not made perfect yet when we come to trust in Christ, right? Amen? This is what we learned last week. We are being transformed. We are growing in the truths of the gospel. And this is discipleship. And Paul's encouragement to Timothy for us uh, is that's what we're looking at today. And I love for gospel-centered discipleship to give us a little bit of a definition before we look at the framework that Paul gives here. Uh, I love pastor and author uh, Jonathan Dotson has an amazing book called Gospel-Centered Discipleship that if you ever want to dig a little bit more, I couldn't encourage you to read it more. Um, But he says this on gospel-centered discipleship. It is not about how we perform, but who we are. Imperfect people clinging to a perfect Christ, being perfected by the Spirit. This is gospel-centered discipleship, and this is what we're to pursue. So for us looking at this passage today, and Paul setting up this framework of discipleship for Timothy, I have five observations for us as we work through the passage, okay? And our first observation is discipleship is driven by the gospel, It's driven by the gospel. So if we look at verse 1, it says this, You then, my child, 
be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. This could not be more foundational and vital statement for each one of us following Christ. I'll tell you right now, this is something you should have written on your heart over and over that you can say, be strengthened by the grace in Christ. So Paul's telling Timothy, he starts off by you then. So everything in light of everything I just said in the first chapter, right? He says, I thank God when I remember you. He says, listen, you have a sincere faith. I thank God that you have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. That Jesus is our risen Savior. Like he's telling him all these things, and he says, in light of that, my child. Now, he's saying my child here, not as a demeaning term, right? Not that like, Timothy, you can't do anything, like a little child. No, it's one of endearment, and that we need to understand as disciples of Christ, we are family. And that when we're walking with one another, that we are seen as brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, all in Christ together, even though we might not have the same bloodline, we have the same bloodline through Christ. So he says, my child. Paul cared for Timothy greatly, greatly, greatly. And so he says, my child, be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. Now, it would appear that young Timothy had many fears and anxieties. Anybody have fears? Yeah, I love the laugh. Like, amen. Yes, we have fears. Um, I will not tell you in depth about my fears of birds, but I have fears. <laughs> um, peacocks, mainly peacocks. Um, he's telling Timothy, be strengthened by the grace in Christ. Like this is the foundation. This is how you're going to do everything I'm asking you to do is the hope you have in Jesus. It's nothing you've done, right? If we go back to Ephesians 2, 8, it says it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So remember, Timothy, be strengthened by the, by the grace in Christ. Now, we have a lot of engineers in here too, right? Laterno, this is not me. Okay, I'm, you heard photographer. I'm the art person. But think of an internal engine. This is what the grace in Christ is. It's something that's continually building horsepower and moving. It's not like a rocket, one-time explosion and boost, which so often a lot of us can think. When I come to faith in Jesus, it was this one moment. It was this explosion. Now I've got to go do all these things on my own. That's not the grace in Christ. The same power that saved you is the same power that's keeping you and saving you and will bring you home to glory with your Savior. Be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. Be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. So I ask you, and we have to ask ourselves, I've got to ask myself, what is your driving force? Like just in a day-to-day -day basis, what motivates you throughout your day? Is it security in another individual? Like, man, if I know that person's around, I'm good. Like that, I'm going to be able to make it through my day. Or is it, hey, I can just grind my way through my day if I can make it to that one moment when I get me time, right? I love my me time. Like, can I get there and I'll be all right? Do you find the ability to keep going if the bank account's full? And like all the bills are paid and there's no financial stress. Like when it's that moment, I find strength. Paul's telling Timothy, no matter what's happening in your life, be strengthened by the grace in Christ. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if we find our strength in any of those things or my own strength, right? We live, I say this all the time too, we live in a Nike era, right? Just do it. Like it's on me. If we're trusting in those things, we will have an extreme barrier to walking in gospel-centered discipleship that Jesus is asking us. We must be driven by the gospel. We must be driven by the gospel. And that brings us to our second observation. And it ties directly to it. Because what's amazing is, Paul then says, and. Okay? So our second observation is, discipleship is meant to reproduce. It's meant to reproduce. So in verse 2, like I said, he says, be strengthened by the grace in Christ Jesus. And then he says, and. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he's continuing his sentence, and he's telling Timothy, listen, you're being strengthened, but in the same breath, now go do this. What you've heard from me, and Paul has now entrusted this to Timothy. We even see this in the first chapter again. He's like, listen, you've been entrusted with this. Guard the good deposit that you've been entrusted to. Timothy's heard this message over and over from Paul, 
He was right there with him in Thessalonica, Ephesus, different churches. And so that's what Paul's saying. Like, you've heard me say this. You've seen me live it. Like, what you've been given, now you go and give to others. Now, this, this word in trust here, this is one of like transferring with authority. Like, it's now yours, and now you're being trusted to go forth with this. So just like I was given that camera, I'm now the owner of this camera, and I have the authority to do with whatever I want with that camera. How am I going to care for it? How am I going to live it out? It's one of transferring something valuable. And now Timothy's told not to hang on to it, but to now transfer as well. What's amazing, when you look through this passage, if we, if we look at this real quick, and I were to ask you, how many generations of Christians do we see in that passage? So often, I immediately think, well, three. But it's not three, it's even four generations, because Paul's saying, listen, what you've heard from me, so Paul to Timothy, now Timothy to faithful men, and those faithful men to others also. So we're seeing four generations, and it's not meant to stop there, because those other men are supposed to do it also. Like, this is a continual building blocks that we're meant to step into. So my question is, if you've received the gospel, if you came to trust in Christ here today, what are you doing with what you've been entrusted with? Have you held on to the treasure? Or are you seeing that I'm supposed to give this to another? I'm supposed to entrust someone else as well. And, and I'll say on a side note here, moms and dads in the room, uh, specifically stay-at-home moms, if you've ever heard that discipling your kids or pouring the truth of the gospel into them is not discipleship, I don't know, uh, that is not, that's garbage. <laughs> Uh, because listen, those lives we've been entrusted with, Kelly and I were just talking about this weekend, we're like, how amazing would it be if the Lord decides to have our kids have kids and their kids have kids, that we would be praying right now and see there's six, seven, eight generations till Jesus come home that all are trusting in Jesus. And that starts with us right now and trusting the truth of the gospel with them. Now it's the Lord's job to light up their hearts and save them, but are we entrusting what we've been given to our kids and to those around us, family, friends, so, what have we done with our treasure? What have we done? It's meant to reproduce. Gospel-centered discipleship is meant to reproduce. So, and that comes to, then to our third observation. As we're continuing down, uh, discipleship responds with discipline. It responds with discipline. So, if you look at verses 3 through 7, uh, what we see here is we actually see Paul giving three illustrations that would have resonated very closely with Tim Timothy in that day and age. Okay, one of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And so first, if we were to look at the soldier, he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now let me first say here that we need to understand that as we follow Jesus, this is not just what we consider a pleasure cruise. Like we're going to step into some suffering, right? I know so often, like, I think when I came to trust in Jesus early on and, and early on in our marriage, like we would constantly hear this like, hey, you trust in Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Uh, but if we read the scriptures for one second, uh, it looks like every follower of Christ severely suffers. Paul himself is suffering immensely, right? If we look, he's writing from prison right now. And what we see Paul also, when he said in Philippians in chapter 3, he said, listen, my main goal is to know Christ, but to also share in his suffering. So when we're called to share in suffering, we're also sharing in the same suffering of Jesus. Our Savior went to death on a cross, the most horrific, ultimate suffering we could think of for you and I. How would we not do the same? So don't be surprised when we step into suffering. And we're to do it as a good soldier. And so that day and age, there were many soldiers. And, and the point here is with the soldier is he's saying they have a main directive. They stay focused on the mission, the one thing. And so in verse 4 there, when it says they don't get entangled into civilian pursuits, unfortunately, some people have said that it might say, hey, stay out of the secular world. Like, don't get involved with the world around you. That's not what he's communicating here at all. He's saying, have your main focus. Be strengthened by the grace in Christ. Entrust. Stay on this mission. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. We, our aim is to please Christ. That is what we're doing. The second illustration is that of the athlete. Anybody watch the Olympics? I know Alex did, right? 
We love the Olympics in our house. But this would have related to him too. Like there were games, there were people competing. And listen, you had to practice. You had to have discipline. You had to respond with discipline if you were going to win and be crowned with the crown. And so he's saying, listen, Timothy, the athlete has to compete. So as you're entering into these relationships, you have to practice. You have to stay disciplined and respond. And then finally, the farmer. The hardworking farmer is the one to receive the first share of the crop. So he's probably referring even back to like 1 Corinthians 9 when we see, hey, the one that sows will reap. Like this is what we're doing. We're sowing, we're reaping, we're planting seed, we're seeing the Lord go forth, and we're to be hardworking at it. Now the farmer doesn't just, now maybe some farmers do, but they're not getting anything, is they're not just sitting on the couch praying and asking the Lord to bring the harvest. No, a farmer is out in the fields on his knees, plowing, getting the field ready, at the same time praying and asking the Lord, bring rain and growth. So are we working at this? Are we stepping in? Are we willing to suffer with others? Because that can be hard. Like, listen, not only we will have our own suffering, are we willing to share in others' suffering? This is gospel-centered discipleship, and we're to work hard at it. We're to press in. And that comes to our fourth observation. Discipleship is sustained by remembering. Sustained by remembering. I love this. It seems so simple, but yet it is so difficult. In verse 8, Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, is preached in my gospel. Now, in all his letters, Paul is constantly coming back to this truth. Like if you were to read all of Paul's letters, which was predominantly a lot of the New Testament, he is constantly coming back to this, and it's at the center of everything he's communicating, not just to non-believers, but to those that have trusted in Jesus. We need to hear the truth over and over, okay? Like, listen, Clay's going to speak on evangelism in a couple weeks, and one of the things, evangelism is tied directly with discipleship. Like it's not separate. It's exactly the same, and believers need to be evangelized too. Like, we have got to preach the gospel to ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Paul says this. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Continual process. And he said, this is later in verse 5, he said, This is of first importance. That Jesus died, according to the scriptures, for our sins, and he rose from the grave. That's our hope, Christian. Like, that is a beautiful thing that is truth. He's living. He's active. It is not some made-up story that we are walking in. He's alive, and we need to remember him because if we're to sustain in this work, he is the driving force. And we have to remember over and over and remind ourselves, remind one another, because you and I so easily forget. And I know this all too well because I would like to say I'm still not that old, like, I'm middle-aged, I'll own it, I'm perfectly middle-aged, maybe a little over the other side of the hill. But when I go to the grocery store, you would think I would remember a list of five items. I tell Kelly to text me, she texts me the five items. I read the five items, I go in the store, I grab what I perceive to be all the five items. Got it, killed it. I get home, where's the butter? I got the, son of a, I did not get the butter. How do I forget this? We easily forget. And when you and I wake up in the morning, if our driving force is not the gospel, if our sustaining is not remembering Jesus Christ throughout every moment of our day, we will drift, we will move, we will do our own thing. The Spirit's in us to pull us back and convict us. Absolutely. But we have to remember, we have to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. In every moment, because you and I, little secret, are not perfect yet. And we will sin, and we will mess up. And guess what we need to know? That we are picked up off the canvas by our Savior, going, look at me again. I got you. I took care of all of that. Timothy, you're afraid? Don't worry. Look at me. We're going to keep going. That's how we move. That's how we step in discipleship with one another. And if we're not remembering that, Someone maybe hurts us or burns us, and we're not going to be able to walk in forgiveness. We're not going to be able to walk with them, and we're going to give up. We need to remember and be sustained. So, question to you again. Are you remembering? 
Are you remembering your Savior? That's our final observation. It brings us to our final observation. Discipleship requires radical sacrifice. It requires radical sacrifice. So in verse 9 and 10, Paul starts off by saying, For which I am suffering. So he just said, remember Jesus Christ. Like, remember him, right? He was the, came from the line of David. He was the promise, fulfillment of those promises, the Savior of God's people. This is why I'm suffering. Like, remember that? This is why I'm bound in chains as a criminal. Paul sacrificed immensely for the gospel. He's in prison right now when he's writing to Timothy. No matter, and, and listen, think through all the things he went through. What did Paul go through? He went through imprisonment, beatings, rejection, physical ailment. This is what I suffered. But he said, listen, I'm bound in chains, but the word of God is not bound. That is a promise, Christian. Like, even though you and I might suffer, and suffer the ultimate, like if we were to die here on earth for Christ, that's the only release of us to eternity forever with our Savior. The word of God is not bound. And when Christians die for the Lord, the kingdom expands. It just will go forth and move. And then Paul says, listen, since this is a reality, since the word of God is not bound, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they will come and obtain the salvation in God. Now, what he's saying there is the the elect are those that will come to trust in Jesus. Okay, that's what he's saying. And he's saying, I will endure everything. Just like we go through and say, what's that word all in scripture? Well, guess what everything is? I'll endure everything. I'll endure everything. Just all those things I just said, hardship, shipwrecks, all those that others might reach salvation. Is that our mindset? In our house, it should be our mindset. And Paul's telling Timothy, I'm not asking you to do anything that I have not done. This is what he's saying. So when you think about discipleship or entering into a discipleship relationship, what would you endure? I think we have to ask that. Because a lot of us, I think we don't even step into the process because we think, one, we're not prepared or we can't do it, or it's too much. It's too much. And so what would you endure? Is there a limit you will go? Because Paul says, listen, there is no limit of what I will endure that those that will come to Christ will obtain their salvation and be with him for eternity. There's nothing I won't endure. So for us at Fellowship Bible Church, how can you and I, as a family of believers, live this out? How can we have a mindset of gospel-centered discipleship? How can we pursue what, Tim, what Paul is exhorting Timothy to participate in? Well, if you were here last week, uh, you would have heard Alex give the initial statement and, and discussion of launching our DNA groups. Okay, And we believe that instituting this structure and resource, okay, tools and resources for gospel-centered discipleship is a step in the right direction. Now, what is a DNA group? Okay, It's a group that refers to a group of ideally consists of three people, men with men, women with women, who meet together regularly that seek to be known and to bring the gospel to bear on their lives and grow in their gospel identity. It's not about being better, but being transformed through the gospel of Christ. That's what this is. So throughout my time in ministry, I've heard over and over, okay, I haven't been in ministry too long, it's been a little over 10 years, but I've heard over and over from new followers of Jesus uh, to people that have been Christians for 30 years saying, man, I haven't entered into discipleship for several reasons. One, that's, that's, that, that's the church's job, right? Like that's the pastor's job. Like, that's what, that, that's what they do. Or, I don't feel prepared enough. Like, how can, I just don't know enough. I, I don't know how to walk with someone and point them to Jesus. Or, I don't even know what it is, right? You ask 10 people in this room, we might get drastically different definitions of discipleship. Like, I don't even know what it is. Guys, this is the purpose and structure of the DNA groups, of why we're wanting to do this. We're wanting to help create a structure for us to pursue discipleship together. So if we were to break down DNA, uh, it is an acronym. So it stands for Discuss, Nurture, and Act. I think it's hilarious because I can't stand acronyms, but yet my name is initials. So, uh, but this is what it stands for. So D is discuss. 
all right? And you can also think of it like head, heart, hands, okay? So discuss is we're gathering in these groups and we're coming together and we're discussing what we're hearing and learning from the word of God. Like who is God in his word and how do we respond? And we're transforming our heads, right? Like Alex last week, we're renewing our minds and being transformed. Then the second is nurture, okay? And so every person will spend time confessing and repenting during this space. Anybody now uncomfortable? This is what we need to do. When the Lord reveals those dark places in our heart and we discuss it and bring it to bear with another individual and they can now speak the truths of the gospel into my life, that's discipleship. That's growing us in the likeness of Christ and moving in the right direction. We're becoming gospel fluent in these moments because we need to learn and not just say, hey, Jesus died, you're good. Yes, amen. But how does that speak into every different aspect of my life? And we grow in that together. So we hear the gospel out loud from one another. And then final is act. It's our hands, right? So we've now, talking about our head, we're transforming our hearts as we're bearing it on the gospel. And then now our hands, how do we act? And in two ways. One, we respond to what the word of God said. Like maybe I need to repent, like I just said. There's some structures I need to play, be put in place. But then the second is each of us are bringing a name of a specific person, just one individual that we're trying to have a gospel conversation with, right? So if I'm meeting with my group and I'm saying, hey, please be praying for Jason, like please be praying for my friend Jason, uh, that I can speak with him this week, that I can just continue in labor and prayer. And then guess what we're doing? We're not just in this holy huddle where we're like, let's just gain more information about Jesus. Like let's just try to gain more, gain more, gain more, and we're never reproducing. We're holding on to that treasure, like I said earlier. But now we're being intentional, gospel intentionality, and saying, now someone can come to me, hey, have you been praying for Jason this week? Man, no, I totally forgot. Thank you for reminding me. So that's what we're doing together. We're coming together to grow in the gospel and to show and share it outside. Because as Fellowship Bible Church, if our mission is to worship God, share Jesus, and build believers, it can't stay with us. It can't just stay here on Sunday mornings, okay? And I'll say this one thing, when you're hearing this right now, okay, and believe me, I've been there 100%, you might be saying, oh man, church is asking me to do one more thing, here we go, add another thing to my schedule, right, because I know, listen, at our church, we do, you got, y'all do a lot, like we've got a lot of things going on, and I understand this, and believe me, in our history, if you understand Kelly and my story, and with her health and things, when we would hear the church asking us to do another thing, and yet my wife can't get out of bed for weeks at a time, it would be, are we just not measuring up? Are we not checking the list of what we need to do to be that level of a Christian? And that's not what we're asking. I'm just saying we're trying to create a platform that we can continue to grow in the gospel to one another, and this is probably the most vital thing you could do. If you had to pick one thing to do in our church, this would probably be it. And they're to be like the life source of small groups, because a healthy small group will have healthy this happening, because that is gospel-centered discipleship. So please know. So what I would ask, and this is my invitation for all of us this morning, is over the next couple weeks, just pray. Pray and be on your knees and ask the Lord where you need to step into this. Lord, have I neglected my discipleship relationship just with you in general? My life is a disciple, and how am I looking to others? Am I looking to show and share the gospel? And listen, it can be peer-to-peer. We just walk in this. And so then I would say, okay, be in prayer, and then one step, one step is on September 1st at 9 a.m., come to our training. Like just here, we're going to be right in here all together. We're not going to have any classes that morning. We're going to be in here together looking deeper at what this looks like and how can we follow our risen Savior together and be strengthened by the grace in Christ. So together, we can pursue gospel-centered discipleship that's driven by the gospel, right? That's reproducing, that responds with discipline, that remembers our Savior, and that we are willing to radically sacrifice for the cause of Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, hallowed be your name. Would you be worshipped above all? This is why we're doing what we're doing. And that is our cry, that you would be worshipped, Lord. Would you help everyone in this room, Lord, whether they know you have come to trust in you or not, that, that 
you would just reveal yourself to us in a deeper way. That we would be strengthened by your grace. That we would realize we are in Christ when we've trusted in you. And we have all the tools necessary to carry out what you're asking us to do. Lord, help us when we're suffering. Those that are in this room that feel like, I, how, I can't even get through my day. Lord, would you encourage them, strengthen them, and realize their eyes on you is the main goal. And so please heal this morning. Comfort us, Lord. Help us to endure everything that you're asking us to for the sake of those that will come to trust in the gospel. We love you, Lord. Pray you grow a deeper love in us for you today. In Jesus, we pray all these things in your precious name. Amen.